Okay, hopefully everyone's online and we'll uh, get this session underway. So good morning to all and welcome to today's webinar, NAS versus SAN storage. Some helpful guidance from Small Tree Communications. Today's uh, productive studio requires effective shared storage. Production teams need easy access to files at a guaranteed performance level to get the job done quickly and efficiently. But uh, what shared files technology is best for different needs? Network attack storage, or NAS as we uh, more commonly refer to it, or storage area network, SAN or SAN. What does it require to get the best solution in real-time workflow performance and fulfil your general purpose storage needs? Adamex, uh, the Australian and New Zealand small tree distributor, has invited special guest presenter Steve Modica, CTO of uh, leading high performance networking and shared storage provider Small Tree Communications, to discuss his experiences with uh, shared storage approaches and to offer guidance as to which offers the best solution for your business. Small Tree has been a huge success in Australia and New Zealand in multimedia, broadcast, advertising, corporate, education and government organisations and Steve will mention uh, some of the local and the international installations and applications during his presentation. Steve uh, was working at Silicon Graphics when the first sand storage fabrics were released. He had the good fortune to be supporting some of the largest post-edit houses in the world at the time, studios such as Disney and DreamWorks, uh, as they transitioned from NFS storage servers and remote editing to the more complex clustered file system solutions like CXFS and XSAN. Today, small tree clients include a broad list of recognisable names in media and entertainment, uh, sports, government, military, education, telecommunications and more, so we're quite a, a broad and varied list. But before I hand over to Steve, in appreciation of your attendance today, Adamax has put together a webinar special offer uh, and will run until the close of business until December the 15th. Right, here's the deal. Purchase a 16-bay small tree storage solution and receive a Sandling 2 10 gig base T Thunderbolt 2 to dual 10 gig 10 G base T ports at no extra cost. So use this with your small tree solution or with any Thunderbolt equipped Mac to enable fast 10 gig networking via your Thunderbolt connection. And that's a freebie retail value of $780 excluding GST and that's Aussie dollars if you're listening in from overseas. So for those small tree uh, dealers attending, we'll be forwarding dealer pricing shortly, but uh, you can contact uh, me, that's Frank Nicolacci, uh, if you need information urgently. Uh, for those customers attending, uh, contact your nearest and dearest uh, small tree dealer listed in the Adamex where to buy section of your website. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Steve and to thank him for his time today or his evening as he comes to you live from the state of Minnesota, Minnesota, USA. So uh, over to you, Steve. Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for, for coming. Uh, I am, uh, as Frank said, the Chief Technology Officer for Small Tree Communications, and uh, I've been uh, gotten the, had the opportunity to live through the uh, schism that in fact was NAS versus SAN, uh, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about that. I do have some technical slides where I kind of talk about this stuff. I'm going to blaze through those. Uh, I've got them in here so you'll kind of understand why we have SANs and NASs and not just one thing. Um, so what we're going to talk about quickly is the difference between NAS and SAN, uh, which applications prefer to use what. We're going to talk briefly about the Titanium Z, the storage systems that small tree sells and how they take advantage of these things and, and offer the ability to, to, to do good NAS uh, for, your, for your various editing applications. We talk about support, Muted. support in places like Australia that are far away, since small trees up here in, in uh, Minnesota where it's snowing and cold now, uh, winter has begun. And then I talk a little bit about some future things we're working on and we're excited about and we kind of, uh, I, I especially like to cover uh, new stuff that isn't quite ready for the market and, and kind of explain why it isn't ready for the market yet. So we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, so in the beginning, NAS versus SAN, and uh, I bring this up in, in kind of a religious context because it actually has that kind of a background. Uh, it really was a schism. Um, in the beginning, uh, Sun invented something called NFS, 
uh, network file system. Uh, and the point of NFS was that you could have a server with a lot of storage on it, and other clients could get to that storage. And more importantly, they could get to the, to the files as if they were local. It mounts to your system. It looks like a local disk on a Mac system. It looked like a Finder. On a Windows system, it looked like an Explorer. You can open the files in an application. NFS was the first protocol out there that let you do that. And it happened back in 1984. It's a NAS protocol. What, what makes that a NAS protocol is your client asks the server, can I have that file? Can you please give me the data that's in that file right here at that spot? And the server reads it for you and sends it to you. Uh, it's very straightforward and simple. Um, the problem was uh, there were some more brought on for, for Windows and, and Mac systems. And then there was this halt in CPU performance. Things did not go any faster. Um, basically what happened during this period, Intel decided they were going to reinvent the CPU and call it Itanium. It would be 64-bit, and they'd get rit of all that old stuff, that 32-bit that stuff, and that old Windows compatibility stuff. They'd just ditch all that, go to this brand new CPU, and, and everything would be wonderful. And nobody liked it. Nobody would buy it. Everybody hated it. And they gave up, and they went back to making their 32-bit CPU 64-bit. But the upshot of that was everything went slow. Nothing got faster for a couple of years. Um, systems could not get any larger. SGI was a great example. We were trying to build larger and larger systems that would hold more CPUs so NFS could go faster. And we couldn't make it any faster. It was as fast as we could build a system. We just couldn't get them any bigger. So what were we going to do? Well, there were all kinds of ideas out there. Um, one idea was you could build special network cards that had CPUs built right into them. And the network card would do all the work. And then the CPUs on your system wouldn't have to. It would be easier for them. And then, and then that would let it go faster. You could have a faster NFS server by having special hardware. Lots of companies tried to do that. We worked with a number of them. Um, the other idea was, you know what we'll do? We'll let all the clients talk to the storage directly. Instead of going through this server that's talking to the storage, and the server just can't move any more data, we'll run wires using Fiber Channel or HIPI or uh, GSN was another one, and Finiband's another one. We'll run wires right to the storage from the clients, and then we'll just use the server as a traffic cop. Instead of moving data, the server will manage the metadata. It will be a metadata server. And the metadata is very small, and it won't be as taxing, so the server won't have to be as large. We'll make use of the client horsepower to read the disks, and the metadata server will be the traffic cop. So that was another possible solution. And the last solution was, well, since we can't build a giant monster machine, maybe we can build a cluster. So we'll have you know, 100 small machines all somehow acting like one big machine. And then if we could get that right, we could just grow and grow and grow and grow, and, and eventually be able to run NFS fast enough to make all this work. So out of that stuff, the one thing that really survived, that really hung in there, was the SAN. It was, in fact, number two, right? We're going to create a storage fabric. We're going to hook all our clients to that fabric through a fiber channel switch. And then we're going to have two metadata servers that basically play traffic cop. They're just like the old server. They're just like the sun used to be, except the data doesn't move through them. They tell you when you can open a file, when you can get a new file, when you can close or delete a file. They decide that. But you go do the work yourself based on what they allow. So keeping that in mind, SAN was a workaround. SAN was a workaround for servers not being fast enough. That is no longer true today and probably has never been true for most video edit shops. Um, servers today are extremely fast. Um, even a small system, your laptop, for example, sitting on your desk, might have 16 CPU cores. Um, the idea of building a special network card to run some of the work for your system has just completely gone out the window. You have 16 cores, and probably 
OS X and Windows don't use all 16 most of the time. Most of them are sitting idle most of the time. And so those cores are available to do NFS or networking or AFP or SMB or whatever protocol you wish to run. So it is true today that systems are plenty fast enough. There are plenty fast enough servers to serve lots of NFS, AFP, and SMB traffic. A SAN today is really, really overkill um, in terms of the complexity it forces upon you uh, just to work around a problem that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so what I like to tell people about NAS is only one system's reading the disk, much less chance for corruption. You can't have clients die in the middle of doing a metadata operation or go into zombie mode like they do. That doesn't happen on a NAS. There's no licensing for a NAS. You can connect to the NAS. More people can connect to the NAS. You can have as many people on the NAS as you want. Um, you don't have to put in a fiber channel card. You don't have to have a fiber or a XSAN license or any license. You just connect and go. Um, all systems. All systems support NAS. Um, there is not a system made that won't talk to a Windows server. They all do out of the box. Um, Apple, of course, has AFP. That's supported widely in the open source community with Netatalk. And NFS is supported by just about everything I can think of except maybe Windows Home Edition. Um, if you get Windows Pro or Enterprise or whatever their latest thing is, NFS is built in. Um, you know, SANS, one of the things I tell people about SANS is anytime I can get a good diagram of a SAN, it is complicated. You know, not only, you know, my diagram of a SAN, which I'll bring back up for a second, is extremely simplified. You'll notice every system just has a connection back to this one switch, but that's not really true. There's a metadata switch, there's a fiber channel switch, plus there's the corporate network switch. It's complicated. There's a lot of wires, and it's, it's hard to kind of manage and keep track of. So, this is the mix from IDC of SAN versus NAS storage sales. Um, as you can see, NAS is very popular. You know, people love to go out and buy just a plain old vanilla, you know, NFS server, SMB server, plunk it down, connect to it, and go. The Finder supports it. Windows Explorer supports it. You can seek to them. No, no extra software to configure or load. Very simple, very economical, and expensive. Um, why does it matter? You know, why would anyone buy a SAN to begin with? Um, and I'll tell you there's two reasons why. Um, one, uh, some apps do things that are disk specific. Uh, Pro Tools was a great example. Um, back in the day when uh, audio was difficult to capture because computers were slow, uh, Pro Tools had lots of really innovative stuff that would work to save data real time. So you could record your orchestra or whatever you're doing, um, and, but it needed real time access to the raw disk, right to the raw disk. So you might need a SAN for that. Um, not anymore, but it used to be that way. Um, some apps will save data using special algorithms that are that you know uh, that that you know require special access to the disk. And again, a SAN gives you that. Whereas a NAS, you're talking to the server. The server is doing the work for you. You don't get to touch the disk. So these are just some of the apps, and I'll go into these in more detail. But here's just a quick list. Uh, FCPX, for example, to do shared uh, Final Cut Pro 10, you either have to have a SAN or NFS. It will not work with SMB or AFP. Pro Tools Pre-10 required local storage. It didn't even like a SAN. Uh, Avid wants local storage unless you do that little console hack where you type all drives to tell it it can look at NAS volumes. And Adobe, Adobe is probably the best of all the apps. Um, the one thing we've noticed with Adobe that does not work is if you're using SMB, you know, Windows file sharing protocol, you need to be at Mavericks or better on your Macs, especially if you want to be moving back and forth between Windows and Mac. Um, Adobe uh, and Windows, or uh, Mac and Windows, both will save extended attributes. Adobe writes a lot of extended attributes, and they do not match up if you don't have Mavericks. And so what happens is, Adobe will look at a project, if you're running it on, on a Mac, it'll look at a project that you saved on a Windows machine. It won't attach to all the media. It won't connect. It'll be unhappy. And I went through this around and around with Adobe, and they finally said, look, yeah, if you're at Mavericks or better, it'll work. Don't even try if it's before that. So let's talk a little bit about FCPX and NAS systems. Um, FCPX will let you open and save libraries on an NFS system. One of the greatest things about that is it will lock those libraries. And I have heard people talk about locking, file locking. Oh, yeah, you know, locking, it's good because uh, you know, Avid will 
you know, like Adobe might lock a project so someone else doesn't open it. Well, the truth is none of the apps lock their projects. Adobe doesn't lock their projects. Final Cut 7 never locked their projects. They could. All the NAS protocols support it, SAN protocols support it, but they didn't. The app has to do it. The app has to say, OS, please lock this file so no one else opens it for me. And they don't. They don't do that. FCPX does. It actually locks the library. So if you create a library and stick it out on an NFS server, you can open it, you can ingest to it, you can do all your great things to it, and it will be locked. If someone else tries to open it with Final Cut X, it will not let them open it. It will not get corrupted, and the user that is using it will not be disturbed. It works very well. Um, another thing I like to tell people about with FCPX, because it's kind of cool, is disk images. Um, if you've ever tried it, and it's easy to try, it's fun, and there's no, you can't hurt yourself doing it, uh, bring up the disk utility on a Mac. This is a Mac-only little hack. Um, create a disk image. It's a, you know, one of those DMG files that you get when someone's giving you something to install. When you double-click one of those, it mounts like a volume. Well, you can create those disk images up on the server. When you double-click them, they mount to your system as if they're local, but you're accessing them up on the server. It is a great way to save tiny little projects. If you're doing, say, advertising clips, small audio projects, you know, tiny projects, you know, let's say under a terabyte, you create one of these disk images up on the server, you double click it, it mounts on your client. Even better, Mac OS X will lock it so no one else can mount it, and you get full access as if it's local. So Final Cut will treat it as a local disk. Adobe will. Avid will. You use it. You finish. You unmount. Now someone else can double click it and mount it to their system. It's kind of like having a FireWire drive, except instead of getting up and walking somewhere and plugging it in and unplugging it, it's right up on the server and you just double click it. It's kind of cool. Uh, a company called Doctors in Training that does training videos for doctors overseas uses this workflow and it was really nice. Avid. Um, Avid is probably the most complex workflow because Avid has a lot of sort of uh, proprietary schemes for managing their ingested video. Um, so I will talk about uh, the two methods that you can use with Avid. Uh, the one, and I've got a link to it at the bottom, is the AMA method. And it seems to me, and I've, I've noticed this as Avid's gone from 6.5 to 7 to 8, that they are moving closer and closer to fully supporting the AMA workflow. Uh, AMA stands for Avid Media Access. The point of Avid Media Access is you don't have to drag your media into a bin and ingest it and it gets transcoded to an MXF file and indexed. Avid will let you deal with native camera media. Uh, you put it out on a NAS volume, any NAS volume. You point Avid at it and say mount that AMA volume and there's your media in a bin. You can use it. You can drag it into a timeline, use it. It's native. There was no ingest. This document is incredibly comprehensive. So uh, this, these, these slides will be available later. Grab that link, go there, pull that document down. Um, if you're used to Adobe or Final Cut 7 and you need to sort of use Avid for some of your work, the AMA workflow will be the most similar to you. Just connect to the NAS and use it. The other way to do it is with more of this Avid project bin sharing, media sharing thing. Um, we do it using a new tool called Unity Media. Um, it used to be called Media Harmony. It has morphed into Unity Media. Um, this is a little module that runs as part of Samba. It's being built into Samba. In fact, we're paying the open source community to do exactly that. Um, uh, I've been doing testing on it today, in fact, and it's a great little tool. What it does is when multiple Avid clients are ingesting and transcoding into the same place, Unity Media makes sure they all have their own directory. It does not let them overlap. So each system will have its own directory. They won't step on each other. They won't cause each other to re-index, which is the common problem when using Avid with a NAS and using the normal ingest method. Um, Unity Media uh, basically gives each system their own directory and makes all the other systems look like uh, uh, third-party directories or some other system or other projects directory. The upshot of that is only your system re-indexes your directory only. You can see all the directories, everyone else's directories. 
There's never a requirement to update or sort of refresh what's out there. You can always see the latest thing that they've indexed. And it's really slick. And, and the neat thing about Unity Media is it actually came out of a long conversation thread between the Media Harmony people and the FreeBSD people to come up with a great solution for Avid. And they basically explained to each other how these things work. They came up with a great robust solution, and that's what Unity Media is. Um, the other thing we tell people with Avid is that Avid will save projects to NFS mounts. Um, so if you use NFS for your project share, Avid will let you save projects to that NFS mount. And just like you normally would between Avid systems, you can go to File, Open Bins, browse other people's bins, open them, add them to your project, and that all works pretty seamlessly. Um, the only thing we don't have is bin locking. So you can open other people's bins. You can write into other people's bins. The only thing you can't do is delete them, because Avid's smart enough to know they're not yours. Um, but you can write into them. Whereas if we had true Avid bin locking, you could lock them so they'd be read-only. So that's, you know, if you're a larger Avid shop that's used to bin locking, that might not work for you. But for us, you know, for the odd customer that has two or three Avid seats in their shop, that it works pretty well. Um, I, I included that here, Avid project sharing. Like I said, we don't have bin lockings, bin locking. Um, Adobe, best over SMB. I think I mentioned this, use Mavericks or Yosemite, uh, especially in hybrid environments so you can move back and forth between Windows and Mac. Um, I really can't say enough good things about Adobe. I, I realize that they've taken a lot of heat because of the, um, the uh, CC release and people not liking the subscription model. But I must say, they have a group dedicated to third-party integration. And when we have a problem with an Adobe customer, they jump on it. If I, they'll even call my customer. Uh, if, if, they, if something is behaving weirdly with a NAS, they get on it. They've fixed very serious bugs with even Apple's operating system by working around it. Um, Adobe is by far uh, the most communicative, uh, uh, community, uh, uh, communicative and active of all the vendors in terms of uh, making sure their app works with everybody. Uh, I think I talked about disk images. I jumped ahead of myself there. Um, great to use. Uh, we like it a lot. Um, so some success stories. And these are all things that, uh, these are all systems that we've had out there recently that we're very proud of. Um, probably the top one, which I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a Brazilian politics guy, but Dilma Rousseff, her re-election campaign was running Adobe Premiere and had three Titanium Z16s running 724. Um, they had 17 edit systems. They filled all three systems up. Each system was 48 terabytes. They filled them up um, with uh, uh, election stuff, video. Um, that was incredible. Uh, not only because it was such a big deal, but they, they worked 724. They were always busy. Uh, so it was quite a challenge to make sure they were up to speed and working, and uh, 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 especially since their wiring was questionable. They had a lot of problems with the contractor that installed their wiring. Uh, we were able to catch all that looking at our card stats, knowing that they had links that were questionable. They got it all fixed. They got their re-election campaign done successfully. Um, New McPherson down in Melbourne, uh, a video editing shop, does high-end work, um, uses all three uh, applications, uses a TZ8. Um, you can follow up with Atomex, I think, to find out more about these guys, but we're very proud of them, and we actually have a write-up. I think they've got a write-up on their website about all the stuff New McPherson is doing. Um, JC Penney is one of our big customers here in the States, uh, catalog vendor, tens of thousands of images. They usually use Adobe Photoshop. Uh, they're using our product. Um, I'll point out, uh, uh, when we get to the Titanium Z stuff, they actually made a mistake with their backups, overrode a ton of their data, called us in a panic, and we got their data back within 15, 20 minutes just by going into their snapshots. So it was great stuff. Graveyard Cars, I think that's a show in the U.S. I don't think it's gone anywhere else, but these guys uh, do you know, one of those reality shows where they take junk cars and fix them up. They're using a TZ16 and Adobe Premiere. Uh, look them up. They're always saying nice things about us. They're very happy with their storage. And I mentioned doctors in training. And they, I've got to say, they were the very first customer that jumped in with both feet to do Final Cut Pro 10. Um, it's a huge workflow. They do a lot of videos for doctors, uh, very busy all the time. And uh, they've actually stuck with FCP uh, X since the beginning. They, they jumped on it right away and worked with it all through. So Titanium Z servers. Um, 
So small trees way of doing business, and I talk about this later, is to bring together best of breed stuff, open source stuff, non-proprietary stuff to build you the best system that you could get off the shelf. So, you know, for example, it's LSI RAID cards. We use FreeBSD as an operating system. Um, we put all that together and use our experience from when we were at SGI and Cray to tune that system to provide awesome performance. Um, a lot of this stuff is not rocket science to us. I mean, it's very simple to understand, you know, what size IOs the RAID card likes to perform best. Make sure the network gives it that IO size. Um, we do a lot of simulation for that, that type of thing. That makes our system affordable. It makes it price performant. It makes it simple since there's nothing proprietary. Um, I can even point out if small tree went away, our ZFS systems that are on here would be recognized by uh, Sun. They would be recognized by any FreeBSD system. They would be recognized by Linux. Any system that runs ZFS, our, syst our data would be recognized by them. Um, so it's a, it's a safe thing. You know, we don't do anything that like you need to get from small tree or it won't work. Right. We have a web interface that we put on the Titanium Z. Um, it makes it easy for you to manage. But that's not the only reason we put a web interface on it. One of the big problems with Unix systems, and it goes for Linux, it goes for you know, FreeBSD and any of the Solaris too, is there are just tons of these config files. And in the olden days, back when I was at SGI, you know, the way it worked was, you know, if you want to change something, well, go edit this file and put in this line of googly goop with semicolons and all the other stuff and by heavens to Betsy don't get anything wrong or it won't work you know it'll break um, and that's the way Unix systems were managed and configured and of course it's a nightmare because when you crash or if anything goes wrong you gotta go figure out which files to bring back and re-edit all the files you forgot and everything else and it's a mess. The GUI model is actually kind of a, a takeoff from Apple they do this, right? You have the system preferences panel. Everything is done there. Everything is saved from there to one place. It's easy to recover. It's easy to keep track of. That's what this GUI does. We have one file. That file is super simple to back up. You can back it up every day if you want. And it has everything about your system. Every configuration option is in that file. And what's wonderful about that is one day if you call me and say, Steve, we had a lightning strike, we had a crash, whatever it might be, and the root disk is bad. We can't boot the machine. I can put a stick, a USB stick in that machine, boot it up off that stick, recover the config.xml file, and your system is running as if it was booted off its original disk. The ZFS volumes are there, the network is set up the way it was, the users are there, everything's back. And that's why you need something like this on your system versus just configuring some random Linux system to do this work. Um, we make heavy use of something called ZFS. Um, ZFS was invented by Sun. There's a wonderful document out there if you're interested. Um, ZFS underscore overview, it's called. And, it, and it's written by the, the Sun guys describing why they wrote it. The point of writing it is this. When you get a disk today uh, and you plug it into your Mac or your Windows system, the first thing you have to do is tell the OS how big you want it to be. What partitions do you want on this disk? And you pick all that up front. With ZFS, you don't. With ZFS, you get a system, and on that system is a thing called a pool. That pool is all your free space. Then you create things called data sets. That's the stuff you mount. That's the thing you export to your guys. If you wanted to create a project data set, project one, you create a data set called project one, and you export it to your guys. You could create a data set called Monday's ingests, and another data set called Tuesday's ingests. You can create all the data sets in the world you want, because they take up zero space. They only grow when you put stuff in them. And when you put stuff in them, the blocks come from the pool. So the pool is all your free space. Your data sets grow as you add things to them. When you delete a data set or delete files, the blocks go back to the pool, and they are now available for other data sets that might need them. Your storage is, it flows. It's flexible, and data can move between data sets. It's very nice. Um, one of the wonderful things about ZFS is that it can grow on the fly. You could call me after, say, having your Titanium Z for three months and say, Steve, we've filled up our Titanium Z. 
what do we do? The pool is almost empty. We sell you an expansion chassis and a couple raid cards. We put those in. We attach to the expansion chassis. We add those raid cards to the pool, and now the pool is just twice as large. Your data sets don't change. You don't have to rebuild anything. You don't have to rebuild any raids. You don't have to restripe anything. The way ZFS works, as you touch, modify files, ingest new files, they all get restriped across the entire array. They go faster. They're rewritten. If your ZFS volume was very, very full and fragmented because you got it right down to the last few blocks and so it fragmented as you were writing data, that fragmentation will undo itself. As you modify files, the file is restriped across the entire array, array unfragmented. Um, ZFS is, is really, really amazing for that reason. Um, there's no licensing on the system. We don't limit you to a number of users. Um, built into that system, we also offer UPS support. Uh, we use an open source tool called NUT, and I forget what that stands for, but it's uh, it's network UPS tool or something, and it lets you support you know, uninterruptible power supplies, so your Titanium Z can plug in and monitor when it's on battery power or wall power and shut itself down if necessary. We support R-Sync. R-Sync lets you incrementally black back up data to other systems and have a working live copy of your data that's in sync all the time. So you can use R-Sync to make sure that your data sets are copied across to a backup server. Um, snapshots. Snapshots are a great way of having a, a kind of a trash can on steroids. Um, you may know that your users will delete files and sometimes say, oh gosh, I didn't want to delete that file. Oh my gosh, it's gone. What do I do? Well, a snapshot saves essentially a copy of everything that was on that file system uh, the day before, you know, whenever you snapped at the snapshot. So if your user deletes a file, the snapshot will hang on to that file and not let the blocks go back to the pool until the snapshot has aged out. Snapshots, you can make them last a week, two weeks, a month. You can have a snapshot every day. You can take a snapshot every hour. A lot of people take one every day um, uh, and then keep the weekend snapshot for much longer. So they keep dailies maybe a week. They keep their weekend snapshots a month. The benefit is, again, one of your guys comes to you, oh my gosh, I deleted a file. You mount the snapshot. It gives you an older copy of the exact same data. There's your file. Drag it back where it belongs. You're good. Um, one of the things we've added recently, and it's in our latest release of the Titanium Z software, is Active Directory support. Uh, we support LDAP. We also support uh, uh, Open Directory. So you can take your Titanium Z. You can connect it to your built-in Active Directory. If you've got Windows systems managing all your users on your network, we can connect to that and use your users. Um, we also will act as a domain controller. If you want the Titanium Z to store your username so that it can hand them out to other people, the Titanium Z can do that. Data integrity. Um, the way we do the ZFS volumes on a Titanium are through LSI RAID controllers. We use uh, LSI's PCI3 RAID controllers, the latest 6 gigabit controllers. Um, we stripe with ZFS across multiple controllers. Each controller is like its own disk, like its own device. Um, the LSI RAID controllers do what are called uh, patrol reads. So whenever your system is idle, those RAID cards go out and start reading the RAID to make sure the data is consistent with parity and it fixes anything that may have gone through bit rot. So you'll read a lot about bit rot if data sits out on your disk for a long time and they, they say it rots. Well, LSI RAID controllers don't let that happen and they will go out and make sure your data is consistent. Um, we support, like I said, snapshots, redundant power supplies in all Titanium Zs, so if you lose a power supply, it keeps running. Um, very nice system where it comes to, when it comes to data integrity. So modern day support. How do we support you when you're in Australia and we're here? Well, we do it uh, very much like we're doing this. Um, TeamViewer is our favorite tool. Works around the world. We've used it in Indonesia, India. Denmark, Australia, obviously, England all the time. Um, obviously, many of our customers in the United States. Uh, uh, obviously, Brazil, uh, when we were helping uh, Dilma Rousseff's campaign. Um, and the way TeamViewer works, you take a Mac or a Windows machine, you load TeamViewer on it, you run it, we're able to grab and control your screen. It only works when you have it running, so you're not at any security risk. Uh, you basically call us and say, I need some help. You bring up TeamViewer, we connect, we make the fixes, we go away. Um, 
Obviously, Atomex could do that, or your local reseller could do that as well. Uh, so you'd have someone in your time zone. Uh, it works very well. Um, we build a number of tools right into the titanium, so we can do a lot of the debugging we need to do if there's any question of performance. All that stuff's built into the titanium, so we can work on it. So I've gone through all the titanium stuff, the NAS versus SAN stuff. Before I move on to some future technology stuff, does anybody have any questions? All right. I'm going to go on and talk about some of these future technologies. And then, uh, I decided to talk about 40 gig because we're working on that right now. And I have these wonderful com conversations about 40 gig because it's been around for a long time. I think two NABs ago, I had Mellanox coming to me wanting to sell me 40 gig cards and switches, and drivers existed for their chip and everything. You could buy 40 gigabit cards and switches. And, and uh, my engineer who's working on 40 gig asked me today, you know, is, is just there really a place for 40 gig? You know, what do you think is going to happen with this? And um, so 40 gig is, is, is done. It's out there. It's coming. Intel's got chips out there now, and there will be more 40 gig adapters very soon. Um, it, uh, it, it's interestingly, it can run as 40 gigabit Ethernet, but it can also run as 10, four, I'm sorry, four 10 gigabit ports. It can do either one. Um, which is very interesting for us as a driver writing company because we have to write the drivers to let it do that. So that's hard. That's actually a lot of work for us. Um, right now it's optical only. There's no, uh, there's no uh, copper variant of 40 gigabit. Um, it uses what's called a QSFP plus connector, which is kind of like those optical modules, but it's big and fat. Um, it's much fatter than, than an SFP. Um, and the thing that I tell people, and this is why we don't have it today and why it's important, is 40 gig is too fast for spinning disks. Um, many, many years ago, I got to meet with Larry Butcher, who uh, invented SCSI. And uh, so he's a celebrity in our world. Every, maybe you don't know who he is. But he ran a company called Alacrotec, and we were talking about buying cards from them. And one of the things he drilled into my head was, nobody wants to put a fast network card on a machine unless there's some storage on one side or the other you're trying to get to. You need fast storage or there's no reason to have a fast network card, right? There has to be some resource that that network card's delivering. And uh, to, to put it in perspective, if I built the very largest spinning disk titanium Z I could, uh, 48 disks going as fast as they could, spinning disks, it would saturate one 40 gig port. And I don't know any customer that's going to want to buy a special card and a special switch just to have a 40 gig port when they could do the same thing with four 10 gig ports. It just doesn't make sense. So uh, it's, it's not something that I think people are going to want to deploy now, but I know they're going to want to deploy it next year, and here's why. Um, PCIe 3 is out already, and it is a requirement to go 40 gig. You're going to need PCIe 3 to really nail that. Um, Thunderbolt 3 uh, should, and I think it is going to be PCI 3, and, and uh, that will be required. Um, right now, Thunderbolt 2 that's on most of our Macs and even on the Windows machines that it's on um, only goes about 2 gigabits, uh, or 20 gigabits, I'm sorry. So um, you're just not going to get anywhere near 40 gigabit Ethernet speed out of a Thunderbolt 2 port. You need Thunderbolt 3. So that, that's, nothing's going anywhere until that exists. Um, SSDs. Um, you're really going to need these newfangled SSDs that are coming. Uh, SanDisk has a four terabyte SSD that's coming. Uh, it will be about four thousand dollars, so about a thousand dollars a terabyte, which is very economical for an SSD. Um, and they go four hundred megabytes a second. Now, to put that in perspective, if I had a Titanium Z built with those going four hundred megabytes a second, now we're talking. I could easily drive four 40 gig ports with those disks, and that would make sense to a customer. That would actually work. Um, I don't know who's going to need those speeds, but the I.O. would make sense. It, the system would balance out, and the, and the storage and the, the network would match performance-wise. Um, the other thing that I really need, because I don't think RAID cards are up to the task anymore, uh, I really need SAS controllers that can hold or talk to 48 400 megabyte a second SSDs, and those SAS controllers are still coming. They don't exist yet. Um, to, to, to put some of this in perspective as an I.O. guy, here's what I sit, or sit you know, sort of twiddling my thumbs over. Um, a motherboard that I sell today could theoretically move 60 gigabytes of data a second. 
Uh, the motherboards I sell today could move 60 gigabytes of data a second, no problem. The problem I have is that there's seven slots on that motherboard, and there are no cards that will max out one of those slots. Um, the RAID cards are only about half that. Most of the network cards are only half that. So when I put a RAID card in a slot, I'm giving up all this data that I could be moving. I, they're just not fast enough. And so uh, in our next generation system next year, we're really aiming to attack that. We really want to have a system where we can max out that motherboard and, and really see that, you know, if not 60 gigabytes a second, why not 30? You know, I'm aiming for that. I, I want to see that happen. Um, I always tell people, you know, in the NAS versus SAN debate, uh, Ethernet never wins. Uh, you know, there's Ethernet, there's Ethernet, and everything that isn't Ethernet is Ethernet. And there's been a lot of them. Uh, Fiber Channel's won, but, you know, I've lived through FIDI and SM, uh, 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 oh goodness, what did Al IBM call it? Uh, I can't remember, SNA networks. Uh, there were so many different networks out there, and they all eventually died, you know, and gave way to Ethernet. Um, uh, I, I like simple NAS servers. Um, one of the reasons is they scale so well. You know, if you buy a NAS server and it's not fast enough to handle all your data, buy another one. Put it on the network. Now you've got two NAS servers on the network. Everybody mounts and there's now two volumes mounted on the desktop. You need another one, mount three. You have three times the space, three times the CPU power, three times the network performance. You can scale a NAS that way. You know, you try to do that with a SAN. You know, once you've maxed out your metadata server, it's maxed out. You know, that's what happens with a SAN. So briefly, and I only have two slides on this, uh, Smalltree, we started in 2003, XSGI Cray guys, we write drivers, we also write a bunch of Army tactical router stuff. Uh, I've been uh, to lots of Army bases and got to dr drive around in vehicles out in sand dunes. Uh, we build these little routers for the Army's radios, they're kind of cool. Um, we do a lot of storage and switch profiling, uh, that's how we do what we do. We take basic bare bones stuff. We look at how fast it performs. We figure out how to tune the kernel to make it go faster, and, and that's kind of our shtick. Um, our installed base is tremendous. Uh, Apple, I think, just bought 150 10 gig cards from us. Um, we've got cards and storage and switches all over the place. Uh, I think uh, uh, you know Caterpillar and Chevron are out there. Um, uh, a lot of churches, for whatever reason, like to use our storage for uh, uh, video editing. Uh, Brain Farm did The Art of Flight. We were credited on that movie. Uh, they use our storage. Um, the military radios, that's my hand there, driving around in uh, White Sands, uh, testing to see how our little router was doing, uh, connecting different radio networks together. That was awesome. Uh, that was some amazing work to be able to do. Um, all these big numbers you see here are chipsets we've written device drivers for. Um, and we're doing more right now. I think the, 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 the 40 gig chip is the XL710. So we've done you know, numerous device drivers, and that's really kind of our shtick. That's what we're good at. We wrote uh, an FCOE driver, Fiber Channel over Ethernet, which hopes to one day displace Fiber Channel. So you'll run Fiber Channel just over your Ethernet. Um, and uh, uh, we did InfiniBand drivers early on. That was another big thing we did. And this is our value proposition. This is essentially what we do for you. Uh, when you buy a server from us, um, we've done a whole bunch of performance analysis on all the cards and, and, and things that we use. We've tuned that system to perform well with, uh, with the, the video editing loads that you're going to throw at it. Um, we've done this for customers doing different things as well. We have one customer that runs 30 virtual machines off our storage, and that quite a, required quite a different set of tuning. And we had to get into there and figure out what he was doing and how to make it go fast, and that's what we did. Um, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. My contact info is right there. Uh, email is always a great way to reach me. If you drop me an email, I, uh, uh, chances are I'll probably answer you myself. Uh, and uh, I'm always welcome to, to take questions. So uh, if there are any questions, Mark? Unmuted. There have been a couple of questions typed in, Steve. Um, okay. And if it's OK with you, I'll just read a couple out and sure. um, let you answer them. Sure. Um, one. Uh, was a question about yearly support costs. And I know you can't speak to local Australia and New Zealand pricing and things, but maybe you can outline how that works in the US and we can get back to them about local stuff on top of that. 
Yeah, in the U.S., it depends on, so the way we do it is if you're buying, you know, a, a, a big setup from us, like we throw in one year of support for free, so you get one year of support, and much of the hardware these days is warrantied by the manufacturer for three years or five years, you know, the drives are, and so on and so forth. And we've actually learned our lesson. We've grown to really appreciate our supply chain because, you know, if you buy, uh, let me just point out, if you buy a Hitachi drive through, Hitachi's channels, it, it has a three or a five year warranty. If you buy it through off channels, uh, it doesn't have any warranty. So you have to be careful. You can always find stuff cheap on eBay or, or Amazon or wherever, Newegg, um, but you, you, you buy through supply chains and we're very careful about that. Um, so we offer one year of software support and hardware warranty built in. Um, we always pass on the manufacturer's warranties too, of course. Um, and then beyond that, we usually charge some percentage of the total sale, and I don't remember if it's 10 or 15 percent for a year of unlimited software support and, you know, sort of team view and phone calls and emails and all that good stuff, upgrades. Um, and then there's some discount if you buy additional years. So if you buy, you know, two years at the same time, it's not the same price for that second year and the third year and so on. And then I, I don't know, you know, local uh, sites, for example, in Australia may charge slightly differently to support their on-site presence and other things like stocking local spares that they do. Thanks, Dave. Um, second question. Um, this is a technical one. Mm -hmm. When using SMB on OS X, do you need to use Thursby Systems Dave to get suitable performance over gigabit Ethernet? No. No. In fact, uh, um, I, so, so, I, let me let me rephrase that. I'm I'm going to use the the, the the stock engineering answer. It depends, um, and it depends on what OS you're running on a Mac. So if you're running 10.6, uh, 10.7, 10.8, yeah, Dave is good, and and I would consider Dave. If you're running Mavericks or Yosemite, no, you're going to get great performance, and Yosemite is amazing. Uh, you're going to get amazing performance out of Yosemite. Um, Yos and I didn't mention this, Yosemite supports SMB3. We support SMB3. Windows 8, Windows 2008 server, and Windows 2012 server support SMB3. Um, so uh, previous versions of Mac and Windows supported SMB2. Um, that was the protocol. SMB3 is much more efficient, much faster, uh, it supports server-side copies, which is, uh, let's say one of your users wants to drag a file from one data set to another. SMB3 is smart enough to go, oh, that all lives here. That's all on me. I, I don't have to send you any of that data. I'm just going to copy this file from here to there. I'm not even going to send it to you. And that's amazing because the previous version of SMB was dumb. And it would say, oh, you want to you read this file and then you want to write it over here. Sure, here, I'm going to, read, I'm going to put, give you the file, and then your system's going to write it back over to this other directory, which is obviously a waste. Um, SMB3 will soon support multi-channel, which is more than one network port uh, connected to the same server from the same client. So if you're running Mavericks in Yosemite, no, you don't need to. Just, just use Samba on Mac, and it's great. And I guess that sort of goes to answering the second part of the question is, um, why did you suggest SMB was better than AFP on a Mac for Premiere Pro? Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, if you're going to be doing, uh, you know, hi a hybrid uh, or heterogeneous, you know, workflow where you've got Windows machines and Macs, SMB is the only way to go, right, because your Windows machines can mount it. And, and you don't... In general, when you're sharing files between the two platforms, you want the extended attributes. Um, the extended attributes, just to put some background around that, is how Mac saves all that fancy icon stuff, right? Both, both systems, Windows and Mac, save all this extra stuff around the file. I miss the good old days. The good old days, let me tell you the good old days. The good old days, a file was a byte stream, all right? To me, a file is nothing but this thing. It's just a big, long list of bytes. Starts at byte one, goes all the way out to byte whatever, and that's it. That's a file. And if you got that stuff, you got the whole file. There's nothing else. And the only weird stuff around that was like Windows looked at the extension, right? So if you had .exe, it was executable. If you had .com, it was something, a batch file was a .bat and so on. So there was that. But otherwise, a file was a file. And then all these operating systems got into this thing called extended attributes. And 
you know, I wouldn't mind so much if it was just a bunch of bits and it said, well, this file is hidden and this file is, show this file is red, like highlight this file red, highlight this file blue, highlight this file green or whatever it is, make this file this icon. But all of a sudden these vendors started just putting all kinds of stuff in there. It was, there was, you know, they'd save data about the file. Like data that should be in the file is now in these extended trees. So that, so I went along there, but it's obviously a frustrating thing. It's just as bad as Microsoft introducing spaces into file names, right? I can't stand that they did that, but they did. So we all have to live with it. So uh, anyway, if you're moving between Windows and Mac, you want the extended attributes to match up. And AFP does them one way, and SMB does them another way. You don't want to mix and match. You want them all to be the same. So what I say now, since Apple has finally gotten their SMB support together, you want to use, if you're using Mavericks, you want to use SMB. You want to use uh, Yosemite if you can. And the extended attributes will be saved correctly. And Windows machines will be able to read them correctly. And it all works very well. Thanks, Dave. Um, the next question is, will Smalltree have a way to bandwidth limit a 40 gig E connection? We actually do now. And, and um, the, so to talk about the Titanium Z, it's FreeBSD 10. It, there's a full-blown install of FreeBSD 10 on the system. It's on there. Um, you could, and I've done this uh, with customers, you could run a port snap, download the entire framework for all the FreeBSD ports and say, hmm, I want to install uh, this FreeBSD whatever app, and you could do it. Boom, it's going to install, and it'll be there. Um, it, you, you can do that. Um, it just won't be integrated into the GUI. So I don't have a way for you to go point and click and say, I want to limit this port to this bandwidth. I, it's not there. You would have to go in and do it the old-fashioned way and edit some file. And so um, the thing that FreeBSD uses today is called PF. Um, and I forget what that stands for. But it is a, uh, it is a firewall app. And PF allows you to rate limit any port you want to whatever you want. And you can rate limit in a whole bunch of ways. Like you can rate limit by protocol or by IP address or by you know, port or whatever you want. You can limit. Uh, so we have PF now. Uh, it's easy to install. It's easy for us to set up. It's just not integrated into the GUI. Uh, on the plus side, the PF does have a GUI. And the GUI that PF has is based on the config.xml fi file we use. So, so uh, the integration work should not be that hard, and it just hasn't been high on our list. Um, lately, we've been worried about things like uh, SMB3 support, Active Directory support, kind of real, you know, everybody wants this, right, so we need to get this done, versus the, you know, kind of, you know, lower percentage stuff, like somebody wants to rate limit a 40 gig port. I have a feeling, like, if you had a 40 gig port, you wouldn't be feeding it directly to one guy. You'd be feeding it into a switch and, and you know aggregating out to a bunch of gigabit and 10 gigabit ports instead. Um, someone asked, how many small tree titanium servers are out there in daily use now? Which is probably a hard one for you to answer, Steve, in terms of absolute numbers. But maybe you could give some impression. Yeah, I know when you. If you go back to all the storage we've done, because we were doing ST RAID and then we went to the Titanium, uh, it's well over a thousand systems. And the Titanium Z, I think, has been out a couple years, so we're probably somewhere around 250, maybe 300 systems out there that are running the latest OS. There's probably um, a dozen shipped locally through Atomix Titanium Z servers. Do you think is a oh yeah, system? and then. We, I, and, and by the way, I'm a terrible person to ask because, of course, I, I don't, I hear from people who are having a problem, right? So people call and say, hey, I, I, I had this performance issue and I get on there. Um, I don't talk to all the customers by any stretch. So um, we have the T5, which is a small system, and there are a lot of those out there, too. So I, I'm not sure what the total numbers are. Uh, no. But we can we can certainly give them feedback individually about Australia and New Zealand as well, and reference sites and things as well. Um, uh, here's not a question, but I thought I'd read it out anyway. Someone suggested just by way of feedback and testimony, we have had a six-port, one-gig small tree card in an old X serve, 
being hammered since 2009 and it has been faultless. I mm -hmm. hope to upgrade our now discontinued X-ray to small tree storage in the future. Um, and it's, it, there are a lot of X-rays out there which are no longer supported and on the way out and certainly reaching their age limit can't be upgraded. So um, we are seeing those sorts of inquiries quite, quite a lot now. Yeah, and our network cards, um, I, you know, just to put some context behind this, when we, when we spun off of SGI, we were the SGI network device drivers group. That's what we were. Um, I managed that group and SGI was kind of going out of business and we thought, well, let's form a company. And so we thought Apple's doing great and they've got a 64-bit CPU and they've got really fast machine. Let's write device drivers for them. And that's what we did. We've been doing that for a long time. And um, for uh, thank you very much for the, the nice comment. Um, we do uh, write device drivers for other people. Um, we Obviously, we write device drivers for that card you're using, but we also write device drivers for Promise, uh, for their Sandlink box. Uh, we write device drivers for Sonnet. Do they have a box coming out? Um, the device driver, uh, I want to say the one that's in the current Trash Can Mac Pro we wrote. Uh, I think that's a 210 chip. Um, and so what we'll do is Intel will approach us and say, we got this Ethernet chip. Will you guys write a device driver for it so we can go sell it to Apple? That happens a lot. Um, I think we've done five of those, and I think we've won three of them. Um, so we, you know, we, we know our way around a device driver. Um, the storage stuff is interesting because the only reason we got into storage was because so many people would buy our cards and put it in an XServe or put it in a Mac Pro or whatever, and then they'd buy the cheapest storage they could find from wherever, like the, just the cheapest, cheapest desktop disks in like a Rocket Raid card, and they'd put it all together, and then they'd feed it out through our network card, and they'd call us and say, your network card's too slow because I'm dropping frames. And we finally got defensive, and we got on these systems and started running DTrace, which is an awesome tool, and it would let us measure the actual latency to these disks. And we started seeing, like, well, this rate card's terrible. Look at, look at what it's doing, and look at how slow it is on some requests. And that's when we got into storage. And this was all stuff I used to do before I got into device drivers. It was all DreamWorks and Disney and storage support. And so, amazingly enough, the two kind of melded together in the current small tree, and that's where we are today. Um, we have a question about database uh, for media management. What database for media management do you recommend? Um, let's see. People, lately, we've been using Axel. Um, a lot of people seem to like Axel, and we've known, um, and oh, gosh, uh, Sam Bogach. Um, Sam Bogach is the CEO of Axel. I've known him a long time. Uh, they were actually down in our booth uh, two NABs ago, um, demonstrating Axel there. Um, Axel's a great tool. Uh, it does media management. It generates proxies on the fly. Um, your finder will show these files. You can quickly see what they are by looking at the proxies, and it just kind of deals with it all. Um, CatDV works. Uh, we've, had been, we've had lots of customers use CatDV. Um, uh, I'm trying to um, Cantamo, and um, uh, which we've had success with locally, and um, a number of others. A lot of it's application specific. You need to look at the applications, the type of media files, the type of workflow, the type of work groups, and then um, work with your reseller to configure the most appropriate solution for those. There's a number of them out there, but there's no reason why a small tree storage solution, shared storage solution can't work with the one that's most appropriate. Yeah, all of them for the most, as far as I've been able to ascertain, uh, just work. You know, they point at the NAS. As long as they can get to the NAS and read the files, they just work. I haven't run into any that were specific to a certain type of um, you know, system outside of the ones that are kind of captured by the system. So like, you know, EditShare, for example, has media management built in. Obviously, it's built in, so it's part of their thing, right? But we kind of work with anybody. That's kind of our goal is to work with what's out there. You'll notice we don't include a media management system in the small tree. And there's a reason for that. Um, our customers, we, we're trying to give you the best value for your dollar. Um, and so we don't want to include a bunch of stuff you don't want or need. When you need a media management system, you'll buy one. Um, if I include one, even if I don't give you a license for it, the fact that I went through the work to include it means the price of the product's going to go up, right? Because I had to do the work. 
And so we like to give you something that's solid, does what you need, and not the things you don't. And you can always add those pieces later. We've just about, uh, in fact, we have um, run out of time. I'll squeeze in one last question, and then I'll pass over to Frank to do a quick um, sign-off. Um, the last question I have here, is small tree working on an, a solution for avid bin locking? Yes, we are. Um, and, and in fact, I have been in contact with the person, and this is kind of like a unicorn, because I've heard they exist, but Avid announced at NAB last year that they were going to release an API to allow vendors like us to do bin locking. And I went to IBC specifically to meet that guy. I went to Europe to meet that guy, and I found him. And uh, I've exchanged uh, a number of messages with him, and he tells me they're working on it and will be the first to know. And I told him that I would like to be the first vendor outside Avid to honest and for true support bin locking. I want to be the first one that actually implements your API. I'm not cheating. I'm not hacking. I'm not doing anything any weird behind the scenes stuff. I want to be the first one. And so they tell me maybe I will be. Um, if there are any more questions uh, after the session closes, of course, you can send those questions directly to uh, inquiries at adamex.com.au uh, or, of course, you can um, uh, shoot those off to uh, Steve if you've got his uh, details uh, from before. Um, so, uh, in closing, thank you again, Steve. That was a great session. And uh, remember, this session was uh, recorded, so we'll make it available for replay uh, and you'll get notification of that. Uh, for uh, all registered attendees, and uh, uh, again, uh, you know, keep those questions coming because um, uh, I think that's uh, great that um, you know we we've got uh, uh, the resource there, and we we certainly want uh, all those issues uh, uh, answered. Um, and uh, thank you to uh, our attendees, of course, for taking the time to join us today. We hope this session provided some useful takeaways and helpful guidance, as uh, the title of today's uh, webinar suggests. Um, also, uh, our uh, little uh, promotional offer, and uh, don't forget uh, that uh, for all registered participants, um, if you purchase a 16-day shared storage system, system uh, we're throwing in a, a sand link, um, and that's uh, $780 retail value at no additional cost. So, um, for more information on small tree solutions, contact your nearest Adamex uh, dealer. Uh, of small tree products, uh, details of which can be found on the Adamex uh, website, adamex.com.au, and go to the um, uh, where to buy section there, uh, or just Google small tree communications. So uh, good morning and uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>